In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicott. The official podcast of Bundablog.com, the home for the past two weeks of Adult Swim Yule Log coverage. I am your host, Steven. With me today is my beautiful cohortress, the chicken nugget, the creepy, Danny herself. How you doing, Danny? I'm great. I'm spooky, creepy, yeah. Also with us is the they of theys, our podcast champion, non-binary champ. D Rock in the house. How you doing, D Rock? I'm doing good. I'm really excited. We are super hyped because today we have the writer and director behind the critically acclaimed by us Adult Swim Yule Log, um, aka the Fireplace. We have Casper Kelly, uh, who has a tremendous resume, co-creator of Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, co-creator of stroker and who co-creator of the cheddar goblin in uh the in mandy um he's got some of the best uh shorts ever on adult swim final deployment for clean queen battle walkthrough and uh too many cooks he's written episodes of uh, squid billies and aqua teen hunger force and um harvey birdman attorney at law and he wrote freaking Night of the Living Do, which stars Gary Coleman, which like blows my mind. <laughs> and he also wrote the Scooby Doo Project, which we covered um, back in October when we did our commentary track on Blair Witch 2, Book of Shadows. Um, and we did a live reaction because uh, Danny and D-Rock had never seen it. So, so they got to, it was like a nice laugh track we have for Night of Living Do, we have Casper Kelly here. How you doing, Casper? I am great. What an introduction. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll have to transcribe that for my obituary. That'll be good. I'm, I'm from the Kevin Smith School of Introductions. So if I, I, I like to give people their, 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 their roses in life, sir. So I, I am just blown away. I, me and Danny first saw Adult Swim Yule Log on December 23rd. And we had like a thousand things to do for Christmas. And this movie brought all those things to a screeching halt <laughs> because attention must be paid to such fucking beautiful art, sir. Thank you so much. This really makes me feel good. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was, it was transformative. It was inspiring. Um, it, it was like the last time I got this hyped about a movie was Star Wars The Last Jedi. And, oh, and, wow. and I own so much Last Jedi merch. If we get some Adult Swim <laughs> Yule Log merch out there, you're going to make a bank, okay? If you, that if you get some Yule Log plushies, plush you'll buy them. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me look into the plushie thing. Yeah, I would love to have a movie poster too. There's a few things I wish they would make as well. I yes. think we're just gunning for a physical copy of the movie with like a commentary track would be really cool. Oh, I would love that too. Yeah. yeah. I'm a I'm a I'm a Blu-ray. I'm a physical media person. And in fact, uh a few years ago, I've been wanting to make a movie forever. And a few years ago, I just said, I'm not buying another Blu-ray until I make a movie. So oh, that wow. would like, give me more incentive. And so then I made this movie and then I then I uh then I backed up the money. Not really. 
back up the <laughs> truck and, and bought all these Blu-rays I'd been wanting uh, for the past few years. So that felt good. That's awesome. Wow, that's I, I. I would actually keep all those Blu-rays on like a second shelf. You know what I mean, like on a special shelf. Like these are the ones after. Oh yeah, I should do I, that. I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> I that's, should do that. And a, a lot of them were. I mean, a couple of them were 4K versions of ones I already own. But you know, you gotta. Have, it's 4K now. You gotta have it. <laughs> totally. So you say you wanted to be a feature filmmaker for a long time. How long is a long time since 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 childhood, since birth, like Steven Spielberg? Since... Definitely since college. Okay. I think in high school I wanted to be a uh, like a short story writer, like or a Ray Bradbury, or also like a cartoonist, like uh, uh, Matt Groening. I did that stuff, but then in uh, college, <laughs> and then, but then in college I got a uh, a work study in the film department. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome, <laughs> you know. So that kind, of, I kind of got the bug from there. So a very long time, um, but I, I, it took me a while just because I, I think I, it took me a while to build up to longer form. I, I'm, I short form is very easy for me, not easy, but you know, easier. And it took me a while to uh, just get it going. Was there like a specific movie in your college years that? that brought upon the the bug, you know, cause you know, Kevin Smith can go back and say that it was um, the, the, God damn it. Oh my God. This is how nervous I am. My Kevin Smith mythology. Is oh, is leaving. it the Hal Hartley one? Uh, yes, the Richard Linklater film. Oh, oh, uh, Days, I mean, uh, Slacker. Slacker, boom. Yeah. He credits that with being the movie that was like, shit, I gotta be a closer feature filmmaker. Is there one from, from college that, that really resonated in that way? This is going to sound very sort of what you expect, but I, I had a friend that got a job at a uh, video store and I had seen like mainstream movies, but he, he got a job at the video store and he would just check things out. And so like one week he said, come over and let's watch the movies. And he had Taxi Driver, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and then Blue Velvet. So that trio right there is like, wow. yeah, that was the trio. Yeah. Wow, that is a trio. I mean, yeah. Like oh, and I think the pop up now might have been that week too. I mean, he just he just curated the, you know, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's, like, a, that's a lot of frozen pizza to get through. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but I remember like Blue Velvet, uh, when I saw that ear in the ground, I just stood up. I was like, what the? I don't believe this. Um, yeah, so those wow. those movies uh were, i mean i definitely was a star wars kid i'm a gen x guy but i didn't think about could i do it until seeing those i don't know you've you've managed to do so many eclectic things in your career connected to cartoon network and adult swim like the like the scooby-doo project that that uh that we mentioned before how much experience did you get um like filmmaking from like doing the scooby-doo project and and those other projects because it seems like there was always a you had one foot ready for live action you know yeah that's true uh i did get to shoot a lot of live action and it, it was just such a great supportive environment where uh at cartoon network and we would have writers meetings with other writers and we were all trying to help each other and it was very wonderful um and then when I moved over to Adult Swim, it was very similar, uh, starting to be, you know, these people that I idolize, like Dave Willis and Matt Malero and Jim Fortier, uh, who do Aqua Teen and Squidbillies, um, you know, having them give me advice and, and help me, it was wonderful. And I, uh, on the show, Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, which I did with Dave Willis, I originally imagined that animated sort of like... Um, a frisky dingo type style but mm -hmm. dave was like what if we do it live action and i'm really gl glad he did that um because i think that made it uh maybe uh more, more disturbing more disturbing and it, it made it just stick out a little more and also we just learned yeah. a lot. we directed all those episodes so we almost all of them so we we learned a lot <laughs> uh, uh you know by doing it yeah there seemed to be a period in time where adults have finally like took off the leash and was like okay we can do 
live action. Um, yeah, I think Tim and Eric might have been the first. I got to think. And then yes. a few, yeah. Yeah. I'm a long time Adult Swim person. I love, like, Adult Swim was, I think after MTV used to do a series of strange shorts and, you know, they had Aeon Flux and they also used to do these horror shorts. And after that, I can't remember the name of it. For the life of me, Liquid Television. That, yes, thank you. And after that was Adult Swim. And that's when I, I had my exposure again to like, you know, trippy art, weird art, cool anime and stuff like that that I couldn't see anywhere else. So yeah, I think, I think you're right. Tim and Eric, definitely like the first real like live action stuff that was going on there. Was was that like really exciting for you to see that 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 you were that the door was open now to do more live action work? Oh yeah, but I mean, even just getting over there and being able to make shows for a living it was the biggest thrill imaginable. I couldn't believe it. You know, Stroker and Hoop was the first one. And they're like, okay, you can come over here and we're going to make a season of that. And I'm like, do we, wait, are we, we're, we're, I'm coming over here now. Uh, this is my job now. Yes. Yes. So yeah, it was, it was a thrill. And uh, uh, yeah, directing uh, your pretty face was a great uh, way to learn. Um I think the first season we had five days per episode and by the fourth season, we only had three. So we had to learn to get faster and better at what we were doing. Wow. Well, and it, and it paid off because I, I think one of the few facts I was able to get out, I think it was Tim Rice tweeted that you guys had a 16 day shoot for Adult Swim Yule Log. Yes. Which is Amazing. Insanely <laughs> tight schedule yeah. for an hour and a half feature film especially with the level of effects and the amount of different styles that you guys ended up filming in. And, and this movie is just like, there's so many movies that we watch that we have so many complaints about for the dumbest reasons. Like <laughs> this movie's too dark. We can't see, or, you know, this, this dialogue feels, you know, like they just added it in at the last second. And, you know, it's trying to cover something up. But everything in Adult Swim Yule Log, I don't, there's no nitpicks for this movie. That makes it, me it, so happy. <laughs> it's all no, beautiful. Yeah, because, yeah, we didn't have time, a lot of time in color. You're talking about too dark. We did not have a lot of time in color correction. <laughs> and, like, I didn't even have a, a day and then the night to think about it. And then the next day to go, ah, that's too dark. Or that's, I just had... I, really the one day I mean he was some the great people at company three were doing it but I had the one day where I was there and so that was a big debate of like you know it can drive you crazy because everybody's tvs are different like I want it to be dark like the scene in the closet needs to be dark but not too dark I want to see their faces but I don't want it to look brightly lit you know so I'm very glad you said that um yeah you guys definitely nailed it. And when we when we interviewed the cast in our last episode, um, Sky Passmore made sure to shout out Media Team. And he said that that a lot of the success of the film was was gotta be given credit to the amazing work that Media Team did and uh, and the and the film community that you guys have uh, have, have built in Georgia. In Georgia. Um, how 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 did you feel working with this crew? Or is this a crew you've worked with? before no this was my first time working with him uh the actor that plays satan on your pretty face is going to hell matt servito who's you might also know from sopranos and banshee and a bunch of things i think he's on billions now he uh did a short film and he decided to shoot it here uh with media team and it just was a great short film uh so that was my inspiration to approach them for this movie um and i'm glad i did and i also got a i don't know if they patted themselves on the back but the actors did a great job because there were all those scenes that are like 10 minutes so there's no cuts and you know i think justin miles had a job right up until the day he shot he was on another movie and they had to just meet in the morning to try to rehearse and everything it's not like we had a week to rehearse it which would have been great uh so i, I really gotta uh give the, give them all a shout out I, and i just thought the acting is was really good i was happy with that 
Yeah, they, they told us that we asked them about rehearsal time and prep and they said they had like nothing and they were just working a lot on set with you and, and during the scenes and then that they got a chance to do some improv and stuff. So yeah. And that in their auditions, they got a lot of time to, you know, figure out their characters. Yeah. And stuff yes. like that. I, yeah, yeah, I do talking about like the multiple takes that we that the that y'all did of different different ways of doing things and we that's when one of the reasons we were like oh my god we we want a dvd or blu-ray so bad you can see some <laughs> of these like outtakes and stuff oh i would love to do that um yeah that's from your pretty face where we would we would shoot uh so many takes and just play around not like in a stanley kubrick it, I'm not, I love Stanley Kubrick, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't like, that's not good, do it again, but it was more like, all right, let do, let's do a fuck around take, you know, try, you know, we've done it, I'm happy, let's do one more that we just fuck around and try stuff. If you have anything you want to try, now's your chance. We didn't always have the time to do that, but I tried to do that. And next time I'll try to have more money so we can rehearse. Um, I think because <laughs> of, of SAG, you understandably, you need to pay them to rehearse. Yeah. And we didn't have the time or the money but it would have been great. <laughs> so, so, so it's around the same budget as the, the shorts, too many cooks. It's like in the same budgetary range. That's probably me. Uh, making the story too uh, entertaining. That pro <laughs> I think it's probably more likely that uh, it, per minute, it's probably the same, or it's probably a little less. So it, it would be, it's the same per minute, but it's not literally the same. Mm -hmm. They they ended up being able to find some more money, a little bit more, because it just wouldn't have been possible, you know. So, uh, so I probably should have said that in the story, but yes. Okay, <laughs> we can cut this out if you want. If you don't want to answer, you can just plead the Fifth Amendment. But under two hundred fifty thousand dollars? No, I don't think so. No, I mean if you include the Georgia tax credit, probably still not. I don't know exactly what it was, but I don't think so. Definitely under a million, for sure. Okay, comfortably, that's, comfortably under a million. That's and with the tax credit, super, very comfortably. That's under still a million. insane. That's yeah. Still insane. yeah. <laughs> like, and you only had sixteen days. That's even crazier. Like, my mind is blown right now. <laughs> oh my god. Like Barbarian had like six to eight million dollars, and they got to get their movie marketed. You yes. don't have the luxury, yeah. Like you of, guys, of you know. your the the very concept of your movie means that you can't be like, hey, I made this thing. Like it's it is it is that is that some sort of punishment you're doing to yourself <laughs> that you created a, a a feature film that if you wanted to have the the most effect on someone. They have to be oblivious to the concept of it. <laughs> that just made me laugh. I, you know, uh, and I think that worked, you know, I think that made it, hopefully made it more sticky as a uh, thing that you might share with people, you know, um, but it just made me laugh. The idea of, I mean, we originally were going to do like, it's an hour in that it happens. So really you would have to hear about it and then fast forward in mm -hmm. or, or really discover it in the background when you're not paying attention. But um, we decided that that's probably too long. <laughs> so. Well, there were some funny comments on a, on a TikTok I made that some people said that they put it on the background like their family Christmas. <laughs> that makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> what is this? And yeah, that's my one regret is that I didn't really get the experience of Oh, let me put this Yule log on, and then oh my God, what the hell is this? I watched it because Stephen and Danielle watched it, and we're like, oh my God, this is the best movie ever. And then I just watched it. Uh, I'm very glad you enjoyed it. Yes, uh, but yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, it was a. I, I don't know. I I tried to get my mother to watch it, and uh, and she's like, I think I put it on, but nothing happened for two minutes, <laughs> so I turned it off. I don't know if I clicked the right thing. Did I click the right thing? Yes. And I'm like, you probably clicked the right thing. It's about, it's exactly two minutes before yeah. about, yeah. yeah. And and I feel like that's uh, watching too many cooks and watching uh, Final Deployment. It seems to kind of be like a, a two minute formula because I feel like both of those, both of those shorts, like it's like two minutes before you realize like, 
hold on, something is afoot here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they're not, you know, this is this is turning the twisting into something else. Or that's not. a good observation. I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're right. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's just the the you know the mathematics of attention span. <laughs> Or, yeah. or if that's just a genius formula for, for setup. But if you want to write a Sid Field book on formulaic <laughs> screenwriting, I, I think you can make a bundle. I should, maybe at this point I should cut it down to 90 seconds or a minute because uh, yeah. people's attention spans. But yeah, you want them to work a little bit, you know? No, I think, I think so. I think the two minute formula works because it does, it sort of settles you into what you think you're going to see and then when you subvert that it's like oh whoa and you kind of wake up and you and it, it makes you pay it makes you pay closer attention like in my I, opinion it, and i love like in too many cooks it's like a totally different thing where it's not that it changes it's like oh this is gonna keep going doing this over oh, and over and, okay <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean that I was really into that idea of uh, of um, Andy Kaufman had this comedy routine where he would read um, the Great, the Great Gatsby. Gatsby. Great Gatsby yeah. Yes, and then when people started to leave, he would put the book down like he's about to change his routine, and then when they sat down, he would pick the book up again, which uh, and start reading. But which isn't exactly what I was doing, but I liked the idea of the or like how David Letterman will repeat a joke in on his old show. I like the idea of repeating something where it's funny, then it's annoying, and then it becomes hopefully really funny. And then, yeah, that was fun. I love make. it. I love it. And it's, it's amazing. Um, did you storyboard the film like like a like an animated project? Um, I storyboarded. No, I didn't have time. I did not have a we did not have a lot of time to prep. Uh, I storyboarded a couple of things. Um uh, but not a lot. Like the going into the log, I storyboarded, but but not very much. Wow. So, so you were basically figuring out your entire film in in the exact sixteen day time frame. Yeah, I mean, I would try to do a. They incur, you know, immediate. I'm. I would usually do a shot list uh, and try to do that, like uh, the week, the shot list of the things we're shooting that week. Like, you know, I, I I want a close up or I want a tracking shot, a side dolly into the fireplace, that type of stuff. But um, boards would have been helpful, especially with the some of that sea stuff where they're fighting Leatherface is fighting the log. I think uh, Tim helped out a lot with that, of uh, helping me figure out some things to do with that. Tim Rice? Yeah, Tim Rice, yeah. Should, should I should I interview Tim Rice next? Is that the next person? <laughs> if you want to, he's great. In fact, you should watch his movies. He's directed several movies, and I bet you would give her, give you a teaser of the new one he's working on. Uh, so yes, you should. I'd say no more. He's he's on the agenda now. <laughs> yeah. Um. What What did you eat on set? What What got you through the movie? What What did What we do you go to? Asked the at craft service. Oh, we had wonderful catering. I can't remember the name of the company. Do they remember the name of it? We had a, it was no. wonderful. And because of COVID, it was just individual uh, containers of your meal, which was very convenient. Um, but it was great. It was great. Um, like real high quality. Like if I got it at a restaurant, I would be pleased. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, they were. Andrea, Andrea Lang was raving about the, the little vitamin D packets that you like put in the <laughs> yeah um that and uh that is i didn't try those i needed that um i did try to hydrate a lot but uh uh that is a theory of low budget filmmaking is spend money on the food if you can uh Mm -hmm. because a lot of people are working on a reduced rate and everything so Mm -hmm. if they have good food though they'll be less grumpy they'll be happy so that's a theory yeah that makes sense a lot of sense yeah Breaking news, Casper Kelly spent $900,000 on craft services. <laughs> I have no idea what the breakdown of all that stuff is. I am happily buffered from that, uh, but yes. Tim will tell me. So yes, you right. would know, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, how... you should. Yeah, you, he could talk about um, the uh, the short film he did with Matt Servito too. But anyway, nice. Um, how how long? You say you didn't have a lot of pre production. How long did you have to like physically write it? Uh, not very long. I think of two months, maybe three months. Not, not, and I'm juggling it with other stuff. So not very long. I pitched it late last year and then I got the deal to be able to do it. Uh, I should know these things for the interview, but <laughs> probably like in March or April or something like that. So I don't think I had a lot of time to uh, do it, which was probably good. Like I just had to do it. I didn't have time to second guess myself or, uh, you know, cause it's, yeah, that's a long, yeah. It can be something that's easy to procrastinate, but the fact that it, but I was also a good student. So if something's due like homework, I do it, you know, mm -hmm. so I, now it became a real assignment. I just had to do it. There's something about like constraints that can make uh, any sort of artistic endeavor almost better just by the virtue of the fact that you're forced to like not overthink things. It seems like that was definitely the case on this production. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like I was listening to this uh, interview with uh, Inarito. How do you say his name? Inarito. Inarito. Uh, on this podcast, Smartless. And he was like, I mean, he was talking about writing. He's like, you need to just turn off that logical editor critical side and just let go. And I, that felt so good. Like, yeah. And I think that's why people are attracted to time constraints is you have to let go. You don't have time. And that's, part, you know, like the 24 hour or 48 hour film festival, for example, or the uh, national novel writing month. Right. Since you only have one month, you don't have time to really overanalyze it. You just got to pound out those words. And yeah. then a lot of times it ends up being better than you feared. And it's, something you can work with and edit, you know, like well, you yes, just get it out there. Very paralyzing. I know as a person who unfortunately likes to self edit myself, it can be very paralyzing. So yeah, having that definitely. And I also feel like, I think that this, at least for me, cause I've watched um, a lot of your, uh, your shorts and stuff before. And like a, a few of your, a few of your projects on like when you did worked on Aqua Teen and all those things, I feel like this was sort of a culmination for you of, themes in your stories about sort of like existential horror I guess this just sort of like took a turn into just act, like also gory horror but I feel like you do a lot of like existential horror and I feel like your pretty face is going to hell like too many cooks I feel like that it kind of like is a theme running throughout your stories of like you know things are a little bit off things are a little bit strange just sort of like cosmic horror of life <laughs> kind of thing yes I don't know if agree. yeah <laughs> yeah I'm a yeah and I feel like I'm a happy guy, but for some reason I am very attracted to that stuff. I am a very anxious guy, so I guess it's that partly. I think it's an anxious thing because I'm also I'm I'm I would describe myself as like an apocalyptic. Like I'm an optimistic person, even though yeah, like I'm constantly thinking about the world falling apart and things like that. But I also feel like it's gonna be okay somehow. <laughs> I think, I mean, that's also a very sort of adult swim thing of this, like, humor that almost, like, deconstructs humor in a way, like, that, like, is just, you know, so um, out of the field, it's almost like trolling the audience, and, like, I was really, I really enjoyed having that kind of humor infused into a sort of horror comedy because there's so much on Adult Swim of like there is a lot of like you know stuff that's meant to be funny but in a really horrifying way like Super Jail and like you know some Aqua Teen episodes and stuff like that I was wondering if that was sort of an intentional choice to fuse those things or if it's just comes naturally and like whether you see that as a direction that horror could go in in the future or that you could go in with horror in the future, having that horror comedy that's infused with that adult swim sort of abstract chaotic style. Um, I think, thank you for that question. That's very flattering. Um, a couple of things is I do think 
working on these 11 minute things for adult swim where we we sort of pack it in sort of in the vein of like every maximalist like everything everywhere and all at once how they'll pack it in right i guess i'm drawn to that in a sense of i'm a maybe i'm a little add and i just want more in a movie but also if hey i'm making a movie i'm going to put in everything i've got you know why not you know and then also i think um that there's some things I write that like in, in, in college, I wrote this story um, about Snow White, but it was from the point of view of Sneezy, the dwarf. And he, <laughs> he, he was under the impression that he and Snow White were vibing and that they were going to run away together. He had misinterpreted all the cues. And so he goes to kiss her when she's asleep, uh, you know, but it doesn't work. And it's very awkward when the prince comes in and he, he just sh- he's already told all the other wars to go fuck themselves. You know, I'm leaving with my true love. So anyway, uh, I really was f- kind of from the heart, but everyone was like, oh, that's so funny. So uh, some things I write, I don't, I'm not really trying to be funny. It just yeah. is funny. It just comes out that way. Probably because I'm such a dork that uh, um, it just comes out funny. Um but it's something that I believe. I don't know. It's 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 beautiful. I, I don't know whether it's because I I grew up on on Cartoon Network and Adult Swim, and and you've primed the pump on the audience to be indoctrinated to love this. But but <laughs> indoctrination. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, 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 I kind of. But I feel like we've been like going back to liquid television i think people are hungry for that sort of stuff Absolutely. that's not the not in the in the main formula you know that's outside of the main zeitgeist uh and i think adult swim is one of them but there's others you know uh and i think you just you guys you guys are fellow weirdos that you're just drawn to stuff like that yeah okay. does does it feel special that Adult Swim, like the brand itself, is a part of this film's, you know, title. Um, does that, like, like you're carrying the whole weight of Adult Swim, hypothetically? Yeah, it does. Whole- it's a thrill. Yeah, I mean, I was a fan. I was a big fan of Adult Swim before I got over there. So I got to that feeling of uh, being starstruck. You know, um, I was really starstruck by Dave Willis. Like to get to start working with him was really a thrill. So yeah, it, it feels great. I love it over there. I mean, I've been over there forever. And I'm, I mean, I'm freelance now, but I still always want to do work with them because they're mm-hmm. great. And yeah, yeah. And, and with all the changes going on right now with WB, that's one of the things I worry about. It's like all these amazing places that have been carved out to make weird art, to make, you know, offbeat humor like i'm just worried about them all the time like i'm worried that they're gonna be like you know deemed unimportant or you know pushed to the side so i'm glad that you're able to do this project and i i really hope that it just helps show people like how vital places like adults swim are for like for this like this and i i think the i think the success that it had i don't know the numbers yet of the viewers but uh the success it had in the press and notice I think was very encouraging to everyone at Adult Swim and made them, because it is a part of uh, us. And uh, I mean, we definitely want to make big, I mean, obviously, I mean, Rick and Morty's great, you know, Mm -hmm. we want to make more big hit half hour animated shows, but it'd be nice to always have a place for sort of low budget experiments that could become the next. yeah. Yeah. Was uh, Mike Lazo um, one of the people that that greenlit this before his before he retired? No, he was already retired uh, by then. It was um, Walter Newman and uh, Michael Oline. Michael Oline's running uh, Adult Swim now. Uh, who wrote? Who's the Harvey uh, Birdman? Creator of Harvey Birdman. Yeah. So, do you think Adult Swim's in in good hands? I do. I do. Um, I think it'll be different, but that's okay. It'll be a little different in the sense that everyone has a slightly different aesthetic. But I mean, he he made Herbie Birdman is a great show. He's great. And I mean, Lazo is one of a kind, but 
Colleen is too. So mm -hmm. things evolve, but I think it'll still, what we like will still be there. So um, you said you're a freelance now. So you are, I know, I think I've run a couple of your interviews that you actually are working on more feature length horror. Like, have you been able to get people interested in that, especially with like the attention on this? Are you excited for something upcoming, like working on something? I am working on something, uh, working on a couple of things um, like that I probably can't talk about. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, they make you sign all these NDAs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yes. Yeah. Um, but, and I also am developing pilots and stuff. And I want to write, I'm going to try to write my own, another a spec script. So yeah, there's stuff I want to do. And I'm I'm hoping this will help it happen. I think it will. Like, I, you never know. Like, Hollywood is a very weird thing where you you can spend a long time on something and get paid and it still doesn't get made. Mm -hmm. And I, ha I have friends that are successful screenwriters that have been doing it for 20 years, but they have like two IMDb credits. So wow. one thing nice about adult swim is it's very low budget, but then they work you like, you're going to make a lot of stuff. <laughs> you're going to make a lot. You were going to get our money's worth out of you. So I love that. I want to make a lot of stuff, you know? Yeah, I agree. I think that's nice. I think it's it's good to for especially like up and coming like filmmakers too to like get a chance to make things because that's some of the biggest you know hurdles is just learning how to make stuff, learning how to work in the system, how to work with equipment, how to work with actors, and like you know if you don't get that chance, then <laughs> yes, yes. Although now it's getting easier and easier to figure out a way to do it yourself, mm -hmm. um, which is very inspiring too. In which. Uh, Tim could also talk about, I mean, I think he's made like four or five movies by now. So, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, uh, but it also is great to have the backing of a company and a, and a venue for it to come out and the support. So yes, it's wonderful. You, uh, you talked a little bit before about being sort of awestruck by, by like Dave Willis. Um, I was wondering if there is like one film or one thing in history that you just wish you could have been there to work to be part of making it oh man uh there's a bunch let me think about that uh, name a few that's right uh alien would be awesome to have helped on uh i love aliens too but i'm an alien guy i love alien uh but I, you know so uh, on that debate I, i'm team alien but i love them both um apocalypse now I'd, I'd be in that documentary going through all that trouble with them i don't know <laughs> I, I feel I've, heard, I've heard horror stories about the production of apocalypse now it was like a miserable experience for everybody. yeah well there's a documentary about it you can get a sense uh heart hearts of darkness uh yes I've seen you know, some you of see. uh and then gotta be a kubrick movie maybe clockwork orange i don't know maybe yeah. uh our, our our Dr. Strange love to see Peter Sellers. Yeah. This involves time travel. I don't know if that's allowed before I was born. Oh yeah, of course. That's that's the question. Yeah. Uh yeah. but yeah, Still there's the a fire. Lot. Um or even like Possessor. Have you guys seen Possessor? That uh Cron Cronenberg. Brandon Cronenberg? Yeah. Yeah, I think I, it's I haven't no, we haven't seen it yet. Oh, it's really good. Uh so Panos Panos Cosmatos told me to watch that. I was like, have you seen anything good? And he's like, yeah, watch this movie. And I'm like... Oh, yeah, all Panos stuff that he did this year. He, I saw his Cabinet of Curiosities, which was excellent, and I saw it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, to, I have to see that. Yes. Oh, hold, on that note, I had a... <laughs> for a, a special... <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Welcome, Peter Goblin. To the oh, the Hello! <laughs> Thank you. Thank I definitely you. heard some interesting stories about the filming of that short also that like it took a really long time and like the cheese wasn't orange enough so they had to like mix in orange soda and these poor kids were getting orange soda and macaroni dumped on them for like three hours. Yes. Oh yeah, that's another. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of people you could have on. Uh, Shane Morton, who designed the cheddar goblin and designed the alien on the log on this movie and uh oh, wow. he designed all the horns on your pretty face and like the computers 
uh, and a lot of stuff on too many. I've been working with him forever. He, uh, he would be uh, great to talk to as well. Um, you had a question, which I totally lost the thread of. It was, um, what was what it? What movie set? Oh, oh, the shooting of Cheddar Goblin. It was actually, it was, it wasn't that bad. It was only a day shoot. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, my, the producer, Michael Sokol, uh, produced it. And uh, it was at an Airbnb and uh, that we found one that was as 80s, 90s as we could find. And uh, we just ma made sure to have tarp on the floor <laughs> so it would be yeah. to clean up. Uh, and it went pretty, yeah, we were happy. That's super cool. Um, the the last like uh, fact I'm gonna try to mine out of you is so you worked with six editors to to complete the film. What is it like working with six editors at once? I actually was I've said six. I now I did I counted it was five. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. Uh, because yeah, it was. It, I thought it would be tough or that things might not link up well but it worked out well and i i think i'll name them i'm gonna name them uh give him a little credit uh is kind of in order of the stuff they worked on in the movie uh nick gibbons phil sampson paul painter john breston and uh ned hastings and Ned, very late in the game, had the idea of adding music. I was going to avoid having music, Christmas music, but then he, he's like, I tried it, see what you think. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we should totally have this. This is great. So, yeah, uh, it was it was fun. And we had to do, a, we did a lot of it remotely over Frame.io, and, which is a software. Um, yeah, I wish I had a better story. Um, oh, no. Yeah. Yes. So they, and, so they, you know, you you would you would watch it with everybody, and they would give advice and stuff, yeah. and which would kind of sometimes drive the editor, who's it was their stuff, nuts. Like <laughs> five of five other editor, four other editors behind him, going, "Hey, you could shave some frames off that," or you know, it would drive them crazy. Uh, you know, I can I can relate because I mean, if I was writing and I had five writers behind me going, I don't know if that's the right word, I'd be like, "Right, get out of here." <laughs> Sounds like there were too many cooks. Yeah. <laughs> In the best way. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being on the podcast, for making this beautiful, wild, creative, insane film. Oh, wait, I have one more question. <laughs> You're not off the hook. Um, <laughs> So, so we learned from the actors that you did the oneers first in the schedule, and and then you did uh, the rest of the movie afterwards. When you were devising the schedule, was it based on like you know, easiest to hardest, or was it like, yeah, you know, how, how, what was your methodology behind dividing that 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 workload up? Um, that was a lot of the work of. Um... Our producers and our AD, uh, Claire, um, and uh, I cannot, I'm I'm nervous on an interview and now I'm blanking on her last name, but Claire uh, and Tim worked on, sort of did that. That's that's sort of what a, a, the assistant director does. And I think that was um, partly for uh, block shooting talent and, um the various other fact you know there's so many factors of mm -hmm. and it also it's kind of good to try to shoot in order it was also they the feeling was if we can get like 30 minutes of the movie and shot in three days it's kind of a good feeling to kind of move mm -hmm. on to, you know um and, and things like that um i know that's not a very clear answer but um that's... yeah i'll take it i'll take it did uh did working with the effects, did it seem daunting to only have 16 days to do it? Or were you just like full confidence, no no, no room for fear? There was always fear. Um, <laughs> I think uh, uh, practical effects w went very well, but liquids can always be hard. So some things we didn't quite get and we had to judge digitally, but I was very happy with our practical effects that that Shane Morton and everyone did, but then the the digital effects, um, they ha did not have a lot of time because they had to wait until we'd edited the thing to start doing that. 
And it wasn't even a company we had hired because we didn't have that kind of money. We just hired some guys, you know, some people to do it. And uh, Ben Martin and Derek King, uh, but they rose to the challenge and they, um, it was a lot more effect shots than they thought it was going to be. Like we had planned for 30 effect shots and this is like 120 or something, whatever the number are. So it's one of the really impressive things is like looking at the movie, you really, I realized like how many effect shots you guys had and I'm like, wow, with the, the time constraints and the budget yeah. constraints, that it's another really impressive thing that everyone was able to pull that off. So good on them. If you can give them like props to me, like they did some excellent job. Um, Sure. Thank you. And it, but it really, it really was to the wire. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen broadcast news where they're running with a tape to air, you know, it, it felt like that. Like we were running <laughs> with the, with the move finished movie uh, to get it to HBO max and cart just in time. Wow. Uh, yeah. And that was another thing is like, why did I write a seasonal movie? If, I'd, if it wasn't seasonal, they would probably would have given me another three months to do it. Uh -uh. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't want to wait a whole other year for it to air. You know what I mean? So, but, but I'm glad I did. We we did it. It was a trial yeah, by fire. So about good. it is I think every year now, it's going to get new eyes because people are going to be like, ooh, a Yule log. And they're going to get on it and watch it. And I think, so I think, yeah, the seasonal aspect of it, while it was stressful and and like very like down to the wire like really helps i think give the film new life every year i hope so i hope so thank you did you ever get to meet gary coleman for night of living do <laughs> i i'm i i worked with him over the phone i didn't get to meet him in person um but he uh he was cool um but he had to renew his sag card to do that our show oh our wow. wow uh and um yeah, he was an interesting guy he was an oh yeah it was kind of this kind of awkward but um he's like i, I want to do more cartoon voices um but mark hamill keeps stealing all the jobs because you know mark <laughs> hamill is a very voice versatile uh who is also in that show uh yeah. and i said well gary you know if i i'll keep you in mind and i go what other voices do you do let me do some of your voices and i'll keep it in mind and he he had no other voices. <laughs> Didn't he's like I don't really have other voices. I'm like well, and I'm thinking well, Mark Hamill does a bunch of voices. Come on, man. Yeah. Did he get pissed then when he found out Mark Hamill was on his job? <laughs> um, I gave him one like you know, can you do it again this time a little something? And he's like, uh. I'm going to come over to Atlanta and strangle you. He said it kind of comedically, but I had that as my, uh, uh, as a soundbite on my phone forever. And now That's I've amazing. lost it. That's amazing. That's wow. Weird. The, the nerd fight I didn't know I needed Arnold versus Luke Skywalker. <laughs> um, so I have one last question before we wrap this up. Um, because I, I, the, my favorite thing about this movie is like what you do thematically with all these different things. And one of the things I was struck by was this sort of commentary on time privilege that we are simultaneously sort of living in the best time in history, but also like one of the most dangerous times in history for different reasons. I was wondering like why it was so important to you to sort of have both sides of that conversation in this movie? I I sort of backed into that because it started with, okay, the camera's locked off. What can I do? Oh, I can travel in time. So I sort of just backed into that idea. And, but one thing about it is, which I think is effective, is I, I don't have a settled opinion on a lot of these things. It's questions that I'm wondering. So I try to give both sides as well as I can or whatever, you know, cause I'm not sure myself. I think that can work well versus here's what I think. I think you should vote for these people. Right. That makes it maybe less interesting. Maybe. Yeah. I think so. I, I, that's something that we definitely observed and we were discussing like right after we finished the movie that we felt like you left it open for the audience to discuss it and to have the discourse around it you know and I think that that's I, yeah I think you're I think you're right I think sometimes that can be 
more effective is to, you know, sometimes a movie needs to have a perspective or wants to direct or wants to have a perspective or a and that's fine. But I do think, yeah, sometimes it's good to just sort of ask questions and leave it up to the audience to decide like, what's the answer, you know? And there are so many, that I, I feel like the movie gives you enough. It, it's almost, it, it feels to me almost like a college essay <laughs> where that you, you have enough in, in everyone's dialogue to pull out thematic elements that, that, that lend your argument, whatever credence you want it to give in your version of the essay about this movie. Like one of the concepts that blew my mind when I was thinking about it was like the fireplace travels through time and it travels to other fireplaces. And it's like, holy shit. If like, if fireplaces are like the key to traveling through time, you could access so many times in history because people turned on fires and, and for all of these times to be like susceptible to somebody taking you out of existence and like the ultimate horror of like all the sum of your life's endeavors being erased in total it it it's it's like one of the most horrifying concepts you're writing sequels in, we're writing sequels in any right horror movie. Now. these are the sequels this yeah. movie is like the ultimate headcanon movie like there's so <laughs> many different things you can do we were talking with the actors about it too like some of their headcanons and stuff and they were like yeah is there Let any chance of of an Adult Swim Yule Log sequel in the future? You know, Holly is adept at avoiding horror tropes. She has experience. Um, and we don't even know if this is like the same Holly from the original timeline, which is one of my ideas is like, would the original Holly have sold out Zoe the way that she did? Um, and 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 there's also the 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 body that that of Alex that was messed with by the alien that's potential fodder for a sequel like we'll reopen blockbuster we can get some direct to dvd <laughs> these are good ideas these are good idea- ideas steven we should have a meeting um yeah i'm i i am thinking about it i but i got a lot going on but it is intriguing mm-hmm. I'm thinking, yeah i don't i'm yeah um great yeah. answer yeah. We're only saying that because I think that you did a lot of cool world building in this movie. So we're just saying, if you ever think about sequels, I think there's a lot there yeah, that yeah. you can work with. And, yeah. so, and, many and so many horror movies don't give you like any mythology in the first movie. Yeah. And you give mythologies for for so much and, and so many different horrific things. And, and, and that's why we love this movie. Oh, thank, I, thank you very much. I, this makes me really happy, guys. I, uh, yeah, I feel really good. I, I could listen to you guys all day. <laughs> okay, so we will keep him for the next 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, you don't, guys don't need to listen. Um, I have been your host, Steven. And I've been Danny. And D-Rock. And with us has been Casper Kelly. And uh, remember, kids, when you're uh, doing a movie with a million dollars, call Tim Rice, bro. That guy's a, a G. <laughs> but he may not want you to say that. He might have upped his rates by now, but we'll see. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> hey, I wonder. Hey, I wonder. Wondercast? Give yeah. it up for Wondercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Voondacast. What's up, everybody? This is Jason David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Voondacast. You can find it at Voondacast, and I know they love Effie. Subscribe to the Voondacast.